Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to The Upside. Our show is about to begin. It is my pleasure to introduce our two wonderful co-hosts, Beth Goldsmith, Chair of the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore, and Dr. Scott Rifkin, publisher of JMAR. Beth and Scott, take it away. Thanks, Jonathan, and welcome again to The Upside. This is our virtual show brought to you by the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore and JMAR Magazine to keep our Baltimore Jewish community informed during this time of uncertainty. We'll be coming to you once a week with episodes you can view live on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. And each episode tackles some of today's most pressing topics, features some of our community's leading experts, and answers the questions, hopefully, that are on all of our minds. Today, we're going to be talking about the impact of the coronavirus on the sports world. In March, as the global pandemic escalated in the United States, all sports competition ground to a halt. Yet now, three months later, states are opening up and sports leagues are getting ready to begin playing again. This week, Major League Baseball players will report to camp for a potential 60 game season that is expected to begin around July 24th. Meanwhile, in the football world, many college football players returned to campus at the start of the month for voluntary workouts. Unfortunately, some of these schools have already had to halt these practices as coronavirus, coronavirus cases spiked among their athletes. So as the NFL plans to begin training camp at the end of July, how can the sports world protect their players, coaches, and fans? Scott, please introduce our guests. That was quite a uh, introduction. I like that. That was a good job. Very good. Uh, so we have two wonderful guests today. Stan the Fan Charles. Stan and I have known, I've known Stan forever. Uh, he's the founder and publisher of Pressbox that I'm involved with, just to give you a um, disclaimer on that. 25 years of being a, uh, a, a, an icon of, of uh, announcing and, and, and commenting on sports in, in, in Baltimore. Uh, has written for a, a million columns and been on a million radio and television shows and certainly knows the Baltimore sports scene as well as anybody. Uh, and then Gary Stein, who is uh, runs Studio 83 Productions, uh, is the voice of the UMBC Sports and co-hosts Inside Press. Gentlemen, thank you. Somebody's bringing. So, somebody's busy. For being here. Hey, Gary. <laughs> Hey, how are you, Scott? Beth, good. how are you? Good, good, good. And where's Stan? Is he here? I'm right here. How you doing, Scott? Good to see good. you. Good, and good. good to see Beth. Good to see you, Beth, as well. Glad you're here. Beth, you want to hit the first question or you want me to take the first one? Scott, I think you should start because we have to unmute Beth. Oh, okay. No problem. Okay, so here's the question, guys. For those of us that are sports maniacs, and that makes up, you know, 25% of the population. Boy, are we feeling abandoned at the moment. Uh, really no organized sports. You're not hearing much out of the NFL. You're not hearing much out of Major League Baseball that they can't get along. Uh, basketball seems to be in a, in a death spiral in Florida as the cases, uh, you know, can, seem to ramp up in Florida. Where, where's the, uh, the, the shining ray of, of hope out there, guys? Are we going to see any sports this summer? Well, I'll take that first. Uh, I think we will see some sports this summer, uh, but it, it, you know, it really is at great risk to the people that play these games uh, that they're going to be colliding in different ways on the playing field. You know, it's very easy for Rob Manfred up in an ivory tower, or the John Angelos of the world, Hal Steinbrenner. They're not really taking the risk at this point physically uh, and emotionally by going back out on the playing field. So it's going to be very, very complicated to get these games on, even without fans in the stands. So what do you think comes from, what do you think, Gary, your thoughts? I mean, I think the ray of uh, sunshine or the light for sports fans is just the mere fact that they get, you know, as you talk about the addicted sports fan, as it were, the, the, the really, uh, you know, passionate sports fan, is just to see the players come back out on the field and see how it goes. I think, though, that even for the real passionate sports fan, there's going to be more of a curiosity factor 
than a results driven factor this year. In other words, what I'm saying is that, I mean, you know, whoever wins, wins great. You certainly want your team to win, but I think fans are going to tune in just to see what it's like to see how the players are social distancing in the dugouts, to see how they approach the plate with the catcher and the umpire there, you know, football, especially, I mean, that's the anti social distancing sport just by out of sheer necessity. So I think there will, will be a curiosity factor that a lot of sports fans will be looking and observing the sport as opposed to rooting wholeheartedly for their teams. So what's baseball without spitting though? <laughs> <laughs> it's different. <laughs> There's no doubt. I mean, modifica behavior modification, Scott and Beth and Stan for, for all the sports is gonna be really interesting to watch. You're right. You know, what about high-fiving? What about after a home run? Do they congregate around the plate? You know, what about end zone celebrations? What about slam dunks? I mean, everything, everything is affected by this. So those, of games, things, those things are actually mandated in the baseball rules that you can't have. If a, if a manager would come out to argue with an umpire, he's, uh, he's not only going to get immediately ejected if he moves to within six feet, he's going to be immediately ejected. He can be fined. And the players are literally told not to spit, not to high five. And it's going to be a really interesting thing when baseball starts. They're not really going to sit in the dugout bunched together. They're going to sit in the stands right behind the dugout. Uh, so it's going to be an entirely different look. And I think Gary makes a great point about the curiosity. I'm curious to see, are they going to pipe in noise? Are they going to put the, uh, you know, uh, staging of, of sort of uh, cardboard fans and how will the camera work be different than it's been all these years that we've watched baseball. Look, baseball was invented, uh, television was invented after baseball was, was, you know, 50 years into playing baseball or 35 years into playing baseball. So the camera sites for baseball have always been determined by real estate in the ballpark. Now, with, uh, without being fettered by fans in the stands, I'm thinking we're going to get some very interesting looks at the game. But so, and, and Scott, Scott, if I could just piggyback on that real quick, just back to the curiosity factor. I think it's important. And Stan and I have talked about this on the Zooms that we do uh, every week on Wednesday nights. I think they're posted on Thursday morning, sports Zooms with uh, sports, you know, different sports newsmakers. You know, I, I'm um, afraid, but again, still curious, that baseball and football, all the sports are trying to put a, ra uh, a square peg into a round hole here. And what I mean by that is, and again, the curiosity factor, you know, do we want to watch a baseball game that has no fans? Do we want to watch baseball with no players in the dugouts, no spitting, no high-fiving, social distancing rules on, on, on arguments between umpires and managers? Is that going to be good for the baseball fan? And is that going to be a good look for baseball? And then football and then basketball. So again, there's all these complicating, you know, factors that, that, that go into this, which leads us all to the curiosity of what it's going to be like. And I just want to say, I'm already, I'm already depressed by this discussion only because we're now saying there's no, not going to be a kiss cam. <laughs> no, that's right. no, no you're absolutely right. I, I mean, it, it suddenly struck me while we're talking that, oh my gosh, you know, one of the most fun moments, of course, in any game. So let's talk more about the teams themselves. You know, these are guys who get paid a lot, but it's not, they don't usually get paid to risk their lives. So A, what are, what's their vibe? And if we do have outbreaks, how do we manage a season where there's not enough players on a team, where there might be teams that drop out of the competition midway through? So could you address some of that stuff? That would, that would, be, the, that would be the industry's biggest nightmare. And I don't quite understand, and nor do I think they really understand, and I was talking about this last night on a Zoom that I did uh, about, about baseball. Mel Antonin of Mass and Sports said that Rob Manfred probably has some threshold of players that would have to be, you know, show up as positive uh, for them to sort of either 
have a team have to drop out uh, or, or, you know, forfeit games. So it's uh, very interesting. They're giving teams 60 players that they can move up and down uh, throughout the season. Uh, and that should be enough, you'd like to think, uh, but it's going to depend upon how these how these players are able to keep their social distance and live in sort of a bubble that includes their families and, uh, you know, people that aren't quarantining. So it's a very, very complex situation. Well, and Beth, let me directly answer, you know, what kind of vibe do the players have? To me, I look at it like this. If you're a player and you're worried about other factors, such as your family, your health, et cetera, et cetera, you know, players, when they're in season, they like to keep their worries to an absolute minimum. The only thing that they want to worry about, if you can call it worry, is their performance. So here now, in this situation, they've got all these different factors surrounding them. My question is, when we talk about the player vibe, Let's say a player gets into the season 10, 20 games, whatever. And you know what? He's just not feeling it for whatever reason. And then fans see the performance of a player or a team suffer. What will happen then? What will happen to the bond between a player and a team and a fan? I'm not saying it's permanent, but you know, there's no guarantee that the performance of the players, in fact, I would say just the opposite, that this year I think we can expect the players to underperform for a variety of reasons. We also have, go ahead, ahead, go ahead, Scott. Go ahead. Uh, we also have had some players in the past couple of days, Ryan Zimmerman, most notably with the Washington Nationals. He has a young child at home, uh, and he also has a mother that has just moved into his home with multiple sclerosis. So he is opting out. So is a young pitcher for the Washington Nationals. I don't know the reasons. Joe Ross, Mike Leake of the Arizona Diamondbacks has opted out. And I thought this was, I, I, it's going to take me a second to read it or a minute to read it. But this is Ian Desmond, formerly of the Washington Nationals, signed a huge contact, contract with the Rockies a few years ago. Uh, he's making about $15, $18 million a year. He said the COVID-19 pandemic pandemic has made this baseball season one that is a risk that I'm not comfortable taking. But that doesn't mean I'm leaving baseball behind for the year. I'll be right here at my old little league, and I'm working with everyone involved to make sure we get <laughs> Sarasota Youth Baseball back on track. It's what I can do in the scheme of so much so I am doing that. With a pregnant wife and four young children who have lots of questions about what's going on in the world. Home is where I need to be right now. Home for my wife, Chelsea. Home to help uh, guide. Home to answer my older three boys questions about coronavirus and civil rights and life. Home to be their dad. That's Ian Desmond. Uh, that's what's on his mind right now. And he's opting to pass up 18 and million the players that, Stan, the players that opt out, I assume they're not getting paid. They will get. They probably have gotten paid the share of the advance that they got. I don't think they'd have to pay that back. That's a hundred and seventy million dollar kitty that was put out for them to measure out for the MLB union, the players association, to measure out and give people their prorated share of. But you're right. They will not get paid at all, uh, and they will not. They will lose the year of service time the entire year of service time. So the younger players, the ones without the big contracts that have paid them a couple of years and they don't have the big bank accounts, you're probably going to see more of them. And some of the guys who have made their dollars may opt to sit out. Is that a fair statement? I think that is a fair statement. We've heard Mike Trout a few weeks ago saying that his wife is pregnant with their first child. Uh, that's a serious consideration because he's going to be out flying on airplanes and so you could see a player of the caliber of Mike Trout decide, you know what, I'm due to make $35 million this year if we played all 162 games, but for 60, I'm going to make nine or $10 million. It's really not worth it for me to take that risk. And so I think on the flip side, guys, 
I think there's an opportunity for younger players here. You know, younger players uh, that are making the league minimum or close to it, which by the way, most of the major league baseball players do make that, you know, I think the average salary is 4 million, but more often than not, they make 2 million or less. But my point is, if there are older players, more established players, players with bigger contracts that are opting out, I think you'll see younger players maybe get a, a, a more of an opportunity than they would normally get. And it could actually enhance their careers down the road. Let me just throw in, and Scott, I don't mean, and Beth, I don't mean to cut you off from asking the questions, but piggybacking on what Gary says, you've also got the situation that baseball is not going to have minor league baseball today, uh, this year. So what happens to guys that are on the threshold of getting to the major leagues, like a Ryan Mountcastle, a uh, Eugenio Diaz, they would play no baseball at all this year. They're going to be on this 60 man list. And I think there's a pretty good chance that major league teams will give these young players chances to compete at, at a high level to help their development so they don't use an, lose an entire season of development. Yeah. So you've got so some- assuming, Sorry, Scott, I was gonna say, I'm, assuming things go better than we are discussing and things are pretty smooth. We don't have tremendous outbreaks, one or two maybe. Do we think there's a chance there might be fans in the stands before the seasons are over? I would think that's a, a great risk that I don't think sports is going to be willing to take. You know, we, we've got, and not to make this a Democratic or Republican debate, uh, we've got an awful lot of the states that were quick, quick to reopen. Uh, and two weeks ago, Texas was talking about, well, the Rangers and the Astros may have fans in games because their governor has uh, opened the states up. Well, now we see that they're not going to be open as as quickly as they had hoped that they are getting these uh, smoldering and in some cases raging fire of infections right now. I don't think you're going to see fans at any of the games. You know, I, I think I'm going to push back on that a little bit. I think there's a chance, uh, but ultimately, Beth, I think that it's going to be up to the fans, really. Do they, like Stan says, do they want to take the risk to come? I'm going to be optimistic about it and say that, you know, the states that had reopened that are now starting to pull back a little bit will figure it out over the next 30 days or 45 days or something like that. And I'm thinking that there's a chance that if that happens, come August 15th, September 1, which by the way, would be right around, you know, um, baseball pennant chasing time, you know, as it were, when it comes down to the nitty gritty, that maybe, uh, you know, cities and states open up a little bit, and maybe sports opens up a little bit too. And I think the teams need to be creative. They're not going to want, they're not going to even probably be, be allowed to have 40, 50,000 fans in the stadium. So it's every other seat. It's every third seat. It's different packages. It's group night. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, teams are able to have, you know, 10,000 fans and it's group night or something like that. And I think you'll start to slowly but surely hopefully see that come back. But the, but the real answer to your question right now is it's probably going to be up to the fans. And the answer is unknowable at this point. Okay, so let's talk one more thing about the Orioles. It's a little off the subject, but it's still health related. What's the news on Trey Mancini? I think everybody in Baltimore wants to know. Well, Trey Mancini had this uh, colon cancer, and he was very fortunate that they diagnosed it when they did, and it was a full-blown, you know, he had a tumor. It wasn't polyps. So he was, he was, it was pretty well known that once he had that diagnosis and that surgery, he wasn't going to come back and play this year, but all signs point to the fact that at his age, that he should be able to make a full recovery from that, but he's going to miss this entire baseball season. And how about our young catcher we drafted last year? How, what's he going to do this season? Uh, that is a really problematic. I would assume that he will be somehow on this 60 man uh, taxi squad that the Orioles have. I mean, 60 man roster that's movable just so he gets to rub elbows with the major league coaching staff, uh, the manager and gets a little, but I don't know where he's going to get his development time this year. The only thing positive you can say about that is that all 30 teams are in the same boat. Uh, although the Yankees boat and the Dodgers boat 
is a lot more expensive boat than the uh, mm -hmm. Orioles. It's a liner, not a boat. Yeah, yeah. well, Gary, <laughs> Gary, I think, referred to pennants. So I'm curious. Will there always be an asterisk in the record books next to whoever wins this season? I mean, they, there may or may not be an asterisk. I don't control that. None of us do, obviously. But I don't think there should be. Uh, I think there's an asterisk, and I think it's appropriate when uh, to have an asterisk. When something happened that the players or the, or the coaches or the powers that be in a sport had control over a situation and elected not to utilize it or made a bad decision, et cetera. So I'm talking about asterisks like strike shortened seasons. I'm talking about asterisks like the home run record in baseball, where you can put an asterisk next to Bonds' name because of the decisions or the elections that he made in order to get there. I think those things deserve asterisks. But I think in this situation, it's all a level playing field. There's really nothing we can do about it. If Major League Baseball is going to put an asterisk or any sport is going to put an asterisk by a championship uh, team's name or an MVP player's name, et cetera, they shouldn't play the games because this was nobody's fault. And everybody has the same opportunity here, albeit at 60 games or however many games, to win a championship fair and square. I love, your, that's a, I really love your take on that. No, I just, a, wanted, I just wanted to comment because Gary, I love how you said that. The passion and, and your take on that was just terrific. Stan, sorry to interrupt. Go that's ahead. all right. I don't, I don't disagree with Gary, and I thought it was a fascinating question. And it, it, it listen, it's one of those things that people are always going to look back, uh, you know, thirty years from now and go, "That was the seat. Why did they only play sixty games?" And you'll know. You won't need an asterisk. You'll be able to look at teams' sure. records and know that something happened. So they get the Cy Young winner this year has what seven wins. <laughs> you know what was really That's fascinating funny. Scott you'll get a kick out of this um the the new the Brooklyn Nets were 750 to 1 to win the championship about a month ago and then when they announced when the games would be picked back up there was a thought that both Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving could come back and play the odds in Las Vegas and I don't think a lot of people bet on this but uh, that quickly, but before both players said we're not going to be back, their odds dropped from 750 to one to 50 to one, which mm. is a huge, huge drop. You know, I think a shortened season does really level the playing field and it gives, just like we said, an opportunity perhaps for younger players to make uh, more of a mark. I think it also gives a chance for teams that are not highly thought of, as Stan just alluded to, you know, and the Orioles probably being one of them, of course to have more of a chance this year in a 60 game season. You know, the interesting thing though in baseball is in the, in the Eastern corridor, you know, the scheduling is going to be different. Regional, you're, going to play, yeah. you're going to play in a region. You're not going to, the Orioles aren't going to play the Los Angeles Angels or Seattle. They're going to play each team in their division 10 times. That's going to make up 40 games. And then they're going to play the American League East and the National League East teams four games there's five teams that makes up the additional 20 the orioles happen to be in a the most difficult uh, you know kind of double division if you will and they've got the yankees 10 games out of 60 they've got tampa 10 games out of 60 and then they've got the nationals the phillies the mets and the braves uh that's 16 more games the orioles have 36 of the 60 games it's very, very difficult competition. Well, there goes my theory. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, but, but different in different in the in the central division, Gary. That central corridor could be totally different. Yeah. Got totally. So let's talk about the NFL for a minute. We've been talking about Major League Baseball. I have this vision. You know, if somebody dumps Gatorade over the top of the head of the coach. I'm thinking that they 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 pour Purell over his head or something like that. <laughs> but. <laughs> but but where are we going with the NFL? There's no way to socially distance, as Gary mentioned earlier, in football. It's just not even a possibility. And I can't imagine the game you would create if you tried to do that. I guess to play touch football or something. But but what's the football season going to look like? Well, let me just jump in and say one of the poorest looks, and, I, and look, I like John Harbaugh as a coach, 
Uh, but I thought his his couple looks in the past 10 days, 12 days, he did an interview on 105.7 The Fan where he blasted the earliest version of the protocols that they got to look at and said, these are humanly impossible to adhere to these protocols. What are we going to have? One guy shower at a time and one guy lift weights at a time. He says, these things are impossible. And he goes, what's really galling about it, he says, We'll follow them to, to the umpteenth degree. There'll be 10 teams that won't follow these. They'll have an edge, and that's that they'll have a competitive edge. And I thought for a coach to look at protocols as if they're somehow directed at him, uh, isn't the idea to try to adhere to protocols to protect your players? Uh, I thought that was a very poor look. And the other day, John Harbaugh, in a Zoom interview with his media, here in town sort of took a shot at Dr. Fauci uh, because Dr. Fauci has cast a great deal of doubt whether football can be played without people getting sick all, all over the place. And he said, well, the last time I looked, Dr. Fauci is not the doctor of the NFL. And I felt like saying to John Harbaugh, John, wake up. The last doctor we knew in the NFL told us that brain, pro you know, brain injuries weren't caused in football. So I'll I'll adhere to the science and Dr. Fauci uh, before I'll worry about who the NFL team doctor. Uh, yeah, as it brings us back to the question, Scott, of what you of what you asked is what is football going to look like? You know, I, I love football. I've been a football fan for 50 years. I know we all do, okay, especially in this town. I have no idea what football is going to look like because it like it's the anti-social distancing sport. So the only thing that I can say right now or think right now is they're just going to play football. They're going to play it like they normally do. This these histrionics that Harbaugh is talking about, and Stan just articulated, you know, that's all outside the white lines. Once they get inside the white lines, I, I expect football to look like it looks. But I just the whole atmosphere surrounding the sport. The fans, the passion, the celebration, the, the band, the band, the band, everything will be missing. And therefore, as much as I love football, I can't see that it's going to be a great look. To Maybe honest. they could change the games to be instead of 11 men per 11 men per team. Maybe it could be four men per team to I don't provide know. the I don't correct know. distance. So Stan, getting back so to then, do you think? I'm Harbaugh. sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. No, go ahead, Beth. It's okay. I was going to say, so then what do you think about college football? I mean, if we're talking about this, uh, you know, at the NFL, what about college football where there will be kids on campus, where there probably will be kids in stands, that kind yeah. of thing? Yeah, Stan, Stan and I have talked about this. I think, to be honest, Beth, I think college football is even a, in, a, in a worse situation um, because you know there are 32 NFL teams, one pretty much for each of the biggest markets in the country. But there's 113 Division I, top Division I teams. And then underneath that, there are some Division II and Division III football teams that represent smaller communities that, that take up a larger portion of this country. And you know how crazy NFL fans are, but I would rival and I would say that uh, SEC fans, Southeast Conference fans in college football are even more passionate than NFL fans. And so I, I really think it's a difficult situation for college football this year. And it's funny because Stan and I had Rob Ambrose on from Towson University the other night. And I asked him a question and as silly as it may sound, you know, cause he's preparing for football. He's welcoming his players in next week. I said, Rob, are you absolutely sure that you're gonna play? Even though you're welcoming your players back to camp this week? And he was like, well, I mean, we're, par we're preparing for it. We, we think we're gonna do it, but nobody is absolutely sure. So I think college football has it even worse than professional football at this point. Uh, getting back to, to, to John Harbaugh's comments and, and tying it into what you just said, Gary, you guys have been around long enough to know that the coach speak about the players come first and the safety of the players is important, is just coach speak. It, it, business still comes first. And a lot of times that's what you're hearing, I'm sure, from a coach. Um, the college students, they're kids. They're not, mostly they're not, you know, they're, they're adults technically, but they're basically kids. They're under pressure to show up because the coach said so. An NFL player is getting paid. He can make a decision like an adult with a job, whether he wants to perform. I suspect lots of kids on the college teams are going to feel that they're pressured to perform and pressured to play. 
And that makes the playing of the college games even more problematic. What do you think to that? I think that's true, Scott. And I think there's also one other problem. College players are still college students. And college students like to congregate in fraternities and sororities and bars and clubs and student unions and dormitories, et cetera, et cetera. None of that necessarily applies to an NFL player. Most NFL players go home you know, to, to their home, whether they be single, married, whatever it is, et cetera. They have more of an opportunity to social distance as it were uh, outside the white lines. I think the college students are gonna be college students in general. And so I think that there are social distancing issues that are more applicable here to college students than there are to NFL players. Have we heard from any of the Ravens players that they're not going to play this year? I have not, not, not I have not out. heard that yet. Um, and that's probably because it isn't staring them in the face quite as much as baseball right now. Uh, I fully expect the NFL to do away with any preseason games. Uh, and as Gary alluded to, I think the, the logistics of the NFL um, season are much, much less formidable than what's going to go on in baseball right now in terms of the travel and being on airplanes a couple times a week. Like baseball players, football players only have to travel one day a week. And really yeah. probably once every two weeks because you get a home game, yeah. road game yeah. whatever, you know. So let's turn our COVID uh, hat, uh, take off our COVID hat for a minute and put it back on my fan hat. How are they going to look this year, the Ravens? Gary, well, I'll let you answer that much. first. Yeah. I think all things being equal, and again, we're, we're taking off our COVID hat now. So we're not going to even allow COVID into this conversation, how that may affect the balance of power. I think the Ravens are a Super Bowl favorite. I think that uh, the quarterback, uh, you know, Lamar Jackson, uh, really uh, accelerated his game from year one to year two. And I think that that will continue. I think that the backfield that the Ravens have acquired, uh, J.K. Dobbin, for you Ravens fans out there, you probably know him out of Ohio State, makes that backfield probably the top backfield in the National Football League. So, you know, I think the Ravens have distanced themselves, no pun intended, from the other teams in their, in their, in their division. I think that winning your division is the first step to winning the Super Bowl because it allows you to get a home game. And I think the Ravens have done very well this year in the offseason. And I think they, along with Kansas City, San Francisco, maybe one other team, are probably the top four in the NFL right now. I'll share Gary's uh, point of view that the Ravens are a Super Bowl favorite right now. I'm somewhat astounded by all this talk, uh, like I go on AOL to get some news periodically, and just this morning, uh, one of the lead stories is about Lamar Jackson and whether or not the league has figured him out because he's 0-2 in the play, you know, in the playoffs no with Sandy. And I just, it's mind-boggling to me, you know. I think they've admitted to what happened, though. I think they went into that game way overconfident, uh, and they had a young, hungry team, very well coached, that executed things perfectly. And I think the Ravens panicked early in that football game. I don't think it had a lot to do with Lamar Jackson. I, I also think that Lamar Jackson and the Ravens are smart enough to know that, this, that the Lamar Jackson that you saw in 2019 isn't going to be the same Lamar Jackson that you're going to be in 2020. He's a smart enough young man and the Ravens are coached by smart enough men to know that they've got to keep a step ahead. There are things that they are constantly putting into that playbook, which will look different next year to opponents. So the opponents may think they've caught up. I don't know who thinks they've caught up to Lamar, but believe me, they're making improvements as we speak. He's certainly the, the most enjoyable player to watch in that we've had on the Ravens since since uh i don't even know when maybe since the first that, super bowl that run that run he made i think it was in the cincinnati game gary wasn't it the, it was the, it was a the three run. spin run was the most exciting baltimore football play i've seen since lenny moore did something similar against green bay packers in 1964 I, i've just never seen anybody play at the skill level that he's got right now well, and, and, I, and I'll say something else on that. Yeah, and Scott, you're right. And Stan, you're right. 
that he is probably the most enjoyable to watch that we've had in quite a while. But I also think that he's one of the most enjoyable personalities that we've had or that we've been able to watch in quite a while. You know, as Stan knows, I cover the Ravens and I'm in the locker room after each and every home game. And without any disrespect to Joe Flacco or anybody that preceded Lamar Jackson, the vibe these last two years, especially this past year, in the locker room, after games, et cetera, is just a completely different vibe. And the vibe emanates and comes from the leader of the team. And there was no doubt that despite his age, 23 years old, maybe not even, I don't know, maybe he turned 23 during the season, that the leader of that football team is Lamar Jackson, both, both between the white lines and outside the white lines. And if this continues, he's only 23 years old. This, this, he's a generational talent, both on and off the field. Let's switch a little to Colin Kaepernick. Does he get a job? Well, he should, uh, you know, I, I always, I always, the only thing I always question about Colin Kaepernick is if, if, if there hadn't been a sort of a more sim simpler way to have accomplished what he wanted to accomplish without offending people. And I, I, you know, to me, the thing never had any disrespect to our military uh, at all involved in it, but I do understand why some people read it that way uh, with what's happened now it's an absolute disgrace that he's not in the in the national football league he should get a job now you have to question whether he wants to play or whether he can make more money uh and and serve the purpose he wants now it, it would might be better for him to stay away from playing but is he going to be offered jobs I think, I think he, he will be offered jobs. He should, he should be. There's yeah. no question about Scott, it. Scott, I, I do think he will. I think for whatever reason, the time wasn't right uh, two, three years ago, back in 16, when it all started. I think the time is definitely right there. That's number one. So I think he has time on his side. Gary, think, don't, give him, don't give him too much information. He's only asking so he knows whether to draft Ka Kaepernick. <laughs> well, I'm going to give him the wrong information then. <laughs> but I think also, but here's really the key question, Scott is what kind of job is it? In other words, to allude to Stan's point, you know, I don't know how much he's making, but I know he's making uh, millions of dollars with Nike and you know, the different sponsorships that he has. Is he gonna get a starting job? Is he gonna get a backups job? Does he want a backups job? Is it even a good look for the team to have him have a backup job? How does that look now? So I think there's some complicating team by team factors that really need to be discussed between Kaepernick and the team to determine what his role will be with the team uh, at, you know, in terms of whether or not he can sign. And the, t the timing of the, the resuscitation of the Black Lives Matter thing with George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis, uh, it, it might not be the best timing for him. We don't know if he's clicked off to playing mentally and you know, his best look might be to come back and play the following season uh, when he's really had time to work out and be ready for an NFL season. Well, but and that brings to answer up your question. question. He should be offered a job. I, I think he should be. And we don't even know. Look, it's been three, four years now. Yeah. Have his skills diminished? Don't, don't, don't know the answer to that. Beth, did I see a question on your lips or do you want me to keep going? No, you, no, you can keep going. I really, I, I just wanted to apologize that I really thought I had disconnected my phone. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing the shows from Baltimore now in, in Florida when I was there for three months doing my spring training. Um, there, there, <laughs> there, 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 I didn't have a landline, so it wasn't an issue. So I apologize to our audience and to no. our tech, to, and particularly to our tech crew. No Zoom event today is complete without either a dog barking or a phone ringing or a child jumping in onto the screen. I had so, the dog. I had the dog. I had the dog howling when my wife leaves the house. Our young dachshund, she howls to the moon like because her <laughs> mom's gone. So let's talk about two teams who I resent tremendously. <laughs> One is the, the Washington Wizards, who ought to still be playing at, at the Civic Center. It should still be called the Civic Center in Baltimore. Oh, my God. Um, that's a long-time resentment. <laughs> I'm old. I'm old, Gary. I'm old, okay? And, and the other is the Caps, who I, I got to tell you, 
I know people that are just crazed for the Caps. I don't understand the game. It's a little puck that I can't follow. And all I watch for is people punching each other. So what's going on with those two teams at this point? Well, I thought uh, for sure, Scott, that you would say the Redskins. I thought that was going to be the Yeah, first. I thought the Redskins. No, no, I have nicknames for the Redskins, like the Deadskins and another kind of skin, but I'm not going to say that on our, on our show. Yeah, so I was all prepared for that. Well, we over at PressBox, we partner with Monumental Sports and Entertainment, so I can't criticize both of them. Well, in that case, I love the Redskins, and I hope they win the Super Bowl this year if the Ravens don't. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. I – I think, I think in general, I, you know, I'm not a native Baltimorean. Uh, I'm from Miami Beach, Florida. Um, I've lived here now for 33 years, so I consider myself uh, uh, honorary. Um, but um, one thing that I've never gotten into since coming here, to be honest with you guys, is DC sports. I don't have an affinity for the Wizards. I don't have an affinity for the Caps. I don't follow them. Um, I mean, I'll know what's happening with them, but they're really not on my radar. It's not that I don't like them. I don't have any animosity towards Washington necessarily, like a lot of Baltimoreans do for whatever reason, sports, whatever, et cetera. I don't know. I just don't follow them. I love the Baltimore teams, to be honest. Now, I was born, unlike Harry, I was born in Washington, D.C., but I don't have a great affinity for the Washington uh, teams right now. I really greatly respect what the Capitals have going on uh, because they have really built something uh, with their fans. It's just absolutely exciting. Uh, and those fans are really passionate about the Capitals. The Wizards, unfortunately, they can't seem to get out of their own way. The new general manager they have, whose name escapes me, he's a good friend of my friend Marty Conway's, and he tells me he's really sharp. Uh, and I have a feeling they're going to get better, but I have a really, uh, I, I'm, I don't have much an affinity for Washington sports. I've got to embarrass Gary real quick, Scott and Beth, with a know. story, my favorite story. <laughs> Gary's dad, who was a concentration camp survivor, and he just passed away in the last three or four months at 101 years of age. Gary's dad owned a grocery store and a lot of real estate down in Miami Beach, Florida, on Fifth Street in Miami Beach. And right next door to his grocery store was the Fifth Street Gym, where a young Cassius Clay used to train. And Gary Stein, at the age of 12, 13 years old, used to see and talk and interface with Cassius Clay before he became, tell me if I'm right or wrong, Gary, before he became Muhammad Ali. Actually, on used, that point, on that point, you're not correct. He had already, okay. Was he became uh, he was Ali already? already. Yeah. But he used to jog in the mornings, stop by Gary's dad's grocery store to buy fresh orange juice, and he'd sit there and talk to a young Gary Stein. That is that story sense chills up my spine every time I tell it. I mean, you know, it's interesting you say that, Stan, and I know we've talked about it a lot. Um, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I really didn't get the gravity of it all. I understand. How can you? You know, you're a kid. Uh, but um, over time, and actually you've helped me do this, to be honest with you, over time I've come to realize how special that was. And I always say this, guys, the one thing that I do always remember about those conversations, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, were his hands. His hands were huge. They were like feet. They were, they would just engulf you when you shook them. And um, to me, I, you know, again, stupid little 10 year old, that's what I remember about it. But um, he was just quite a personality. And it was, you know, before social media and before all the hysteria really around sports today. And now that I look back on it and it's hard to believe it was about 45 years ago that this happened. It really so, were, those really were special times. So it's interesting that those are your memories of him as hands. And I'll give you two yeah. quick like that. I, I met Johnny Unitas late in his career. I had a broken leg and he was signing my cast. I was about 13 or 14 years old and his hands were so beaten up. Yeah. His hands were knobby and twisted and obviously multiple breaks. And I never forgot his hands. And the other was Wes Unseld. Oh. Remember 
And so I used to come into the Baskin Robbins on, on Liberty Road. And I worked there as a teenager. <laughs> and he was the widest guy I ever saw in my life. Mm. He wasn't the tallest NBA player by any means. But he had to come in a door sideways. He was the widest guy you ever saw. And that's why he was such an, and one of the reasons he was such a great rebounder. He was just so wide for an athlete. Amazing. I'll tell, I'll, I'll tell you, I used to go, my uncle, my late uncle Lester used to have second row seats at uh, the Civic Center for Wizards, uh, Capitals, uh, Bullet Games. Bullet Games. And I was a ball boy. I was a ball boy in 1965 for the Bullets. But the only player I ever saw Wilt Chamberlain not really be willing to tangle with was Wes Unfeld. Uh, they once got into a scrap, and I used to see Chamberlain automatically make everybody else back down. Wes Unsell didn't didn't back down from him, and he wanted no parts of uh, Wes Unsell. Yeah, he was quite a nice guy, too. Great guy. This Great is guy. like a whole nother show. I have to say, this has been so interesting and a whole new show we could do on just these great stories i mean i have one i used to live in a house that had 11 foot tall doors and jonathan ogden and jonathan ogden came to my house because at that time our grandson was ill and he came you know to visit him to bring him some autographed shoes and jonathan ogden walked in our house you know with the double doors 11 feet tall and said now that's what a door should look like. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he didn't duck his head. <laughs> he, he didn't duck his head. It was just, you know, so we could do a whole show just on these great stories because these are great personalities throughout yeah, the got, years. Got a lot our, of our sports teams, yes. Yeah, some of these players are real characters. So gentlemen, anything else we should be, oh, here's the question to finish up with. I got a, I got a finishing question because we're getting near the end here. What sport are we going to see first? Are we going to see the NBA? Are we going to see baseball? Or is it going to be till the football season? What are we well, going to see? It looks to me like baseball is first up on the docket uh, because they're going to, uh, their starting date is set a little bit before uh, basketball is going to start. So Have the unions, has the union agreed to start at this point? Yeah, they're, they're going to yeah. start uh, the, 20, the 23rd of July. There's going to be three games. And then the other uh, 14 games will take place the next day. Everybody's going to play by the 24th. The so baseball is going to be first. Very good. I think baseball will be up first. Yep. You know, I'll tell you what the upside, guys, and I think, Beth, you asked, or maybe Scott, it was, you know, what, what is, what's the ray of hope? What does a sports fan potentially have to look forward to? Come the fall, if all things are okay and going according to plan and there's no major setbacks, our sports calendar in the fall is going to be packed with all of them. Baseball, football, basketball, hockey, horse racing, auto racing, tennis, golf, etc. So maybe that's the ray of hope that sports fans can look towards. One last thing I'll say is about the asterisk we Beth asked before. The one sport that may need an asterisk is horse racing because they now it's the triple crown is usually the Kentucky Derby, two weeks later, the Preakness, three weeks later, the longest race of all, the mile and a half Belmont. This year, the Belmont was run at a mile and a quarter, not a mile and a half, and it was run 11 weeks in front of the Derby and another four weeks in front of the Preakness. So it's entirely different this year, uh, the uh, gauntlet that these horses have to run in case we were fortunate enough to see a triple crown, that would need some sort of asterisk, I think. Very good. Well, that is, that's a great uh, way to end up the show. You mentioned golf. I'm not playing golf until they let me play from the cart and they let me strike people with the clubs. <laughs> that, that, that's how they need to change golf if you want to make it a big spectator sport. Anyhow, uh, let me turn it over to Beth. Thank you, gentlemen, for both being here today. This has been Thank really you. a fun show. Thank Beth, you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it off to you. Thanks, Scott. And thank you so much, Stan and Gary. It was a fun show. And I'd love to have you guys back and we'll tell more fun stories. Love to do gonna... it, Beth. Great to see you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. See you, Scott. So our, ne 
our next show, let me just announce for everyone, our next show on July 7th at noon, it, we will be talking with Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski about latest updates on the coronavirus and the reopening of Baltimore County. So tune in for that. Also continue to visit associated.org and jmoreliving.com for more information, stories, and resources, and sign up for the weekly newsletter. And we want to wish everyone a very safe and enjoyable 4th of July. So thanks again, everyone, and stay well. And one quick uh, announcement, and, and I apologize that Beth and John haven't heard this before, but the new mayor of Baltimore, the incoming mayor of Baltimore, has agreed to be on the show in the very near future. We just need to schedule them. It'll be exciting to hear a new uh, wave of leadership in the city. And it will be a really, I think, interesting and informative show. Great. Sounds great. Be safe, everyone.